Hello everyone. Buenas, buenas, buenas. Bienvenidos. Today we are going to talk about adversary emulation. And just for eco party, I have chosen a threat actor that has attacked in the Argentinian market. So we will go through the entire process in this conversation, along with some live demos, so that you can test yourself against this particular threat actor and improve your detective and preventive controls in your organization. This talk is titled, Don't Get Stung by a Honey Bee, and that is the name of the threat actor. I am George Orchillas, Jorge Orchides. Thank you for being here. This is a little bit about myself. I am currently the Chief Technology Officer at Scythe. We're a company that makes adversary emulation platform for red team and purple teaming. I have uh, published recently a free framework called the Purple Team Exercise Framework. So when you want to do this in your organization, you can show your senior management, this is what the industry is doing, this is how we should do it. And of course you can modify it, but at least you have a starting point. That's free, it's called the PTEF. I've also co-created the C2 matrix, the command and control matrix. We're actually gonna talk about that here because when we emulate adversaries, we're gonna use very similar tools to do and emulate that adversary behavior. Prior to joining Scythe, I worked at Citigroup for 10 years running the offensive team. I started as a vulnerability assessment analyst then I brought in the penetration testing team. And then from there, we built a red team. The red team grew to 12 people uh, by the time I left. And in the last few years, we were doing some purple team exercises and really saw the value in that. So um, has been a, a fun time there. I also teach for SANS. SANS is the industry standard in information security training. I teach the offensive security curriculum, as you could imagine, Security 560. So if you have a GPEN, shout out to you. 504, if you have a GCIH. And I'm also the author of a two-day red team exercise and adversary emulation course called Security 564. Other than that, I've done some other things in the industry, such as the Common Vulnerability Scoring System, was part of the uh, working group and a voting member for version 3 and 3.1, the industry standard for rating and scoring vulnerabilities. Also created a pen test framework for regulatory use in the Global Financial Markets Association. Uh, see, I worked at the most global financial and everyone regulated us. So we built a framework that would meet the requirements of multiple red team and threat intel led penetration testing requirements. I'm also a fan of ISSA. I'm an ISSA fellow and part of the National Security Institute Technologist Fellow. Way before I got into security, I wrote a book on Windows 7. Do not buy the book and do not use Windows 7. It's end of life. But just so you know, I am a published author. So enough about me. What are we going to talk about today? Well, we're gonna talk about adversary emulation. What does that even mean? Is that a new buzzword? Isn't that just pen testing? We'll answer all those questions for you. And then we're gonna talk about how to do adversary emulation. And it does start with cyber threat intelligence. And I'm not talking about that cyber threat intelligence uh, of IOCs and indicators of compromise and malicious domains or malicious uh, files. I'm talking about the top, the TTPs, the adversary me, uh, behavior. So we're gonna cover that. And then we picked a threat actor that is likely to attack uh, uh, organizations in Argentina. We'll then create an adversary emulation plan. We will do that plan. And then we'll talk about defenses, right? Because it's really bringing everything together. The intelligence, the blue team, and the red teams all together. So. So what are we talking about? What is adversary emulation? Is this just another ethical hacking term? And the answer is yes, it's a type of ethical hacking. So ethical hacking encompasses a lot of things. And most organizations mature something like this. They realize that they need to do some offensive security, some 
uh, sort of ethical hacking and they start doing vulnerability scanning. This is where you take your Nessus or your Qualys or you know any of those um, scanners and you point it at a web application or an IP address or your network range or internal IPs. You hit go and it takes some time then it gives you back this large report. Large report that no one wants to read, but you have to go through it, right? And just giving this to the operational owners, the people that manage the infrastructure or the web app is not ideal because they could have technically ran that scan themselves. So we started doing vulnerability assessment. That's where we take the output of a vulnerability scan and use that to assess the actual vulnerability. We uh, calculate the CVSS score using the temporal environmental variables, which is a score you have to put in for your environment. And you get an, a list of prioritized vulnerabilities that you should patch. So now instead of giving a 600 uh, page report, you give a report that is 30 pages. And it just says, these are the critical vulnerabilities you have to fix. After that, um, and particularly in our organization, we wanted to actually exploit vulnerabilities. And that's where we started doing penetration testing. So to differentiate from vulnerability assessment, where you verify a vulnerability, in a penetration test, you are exploiting that vulnerability. You're actually getting a shell, which was great because now you had access to a target operating system. You can calculate the business risk a little better. Notice that it's a production database that has customer information that is way more eye-opening and way more valuable for the business. So you start doing penetration testing, finding and exploiting vulnerabilities. There's a whole bug bounty that's part of uh, penetration testing where you find vulnerabilities, you draft them and you report them as zero days as vulnerabilities that the vendor doesn't know and you can get paid for those too. So um, lots of things in pen testing. But then we started talking about not only testing technology and these preventive controls, right? Vulnerabilities are patched. What about the people? What about the process? What about the security, the detective controls? And that's when we started talking about red teaming. And this term came from the military and we started doing some red team engagements. Um, mostly zero knowledge, where the blue team, the defenders, had no idea what we were doing, as opposed to a pen test where they generally do. And we would do that once a year, and it would end up in, again, a report that said how we got in and what they need to do to not let us get in again. They would fix that. But that would happen maybe once a year. So what did we do in, in between that? Well, we had our red team. We were fishing our people all the time to help them improve. But we figured that if we actually work and collaborate with the blue team, we can be more efficient. That's where purple team came about. We started doing that. And then as part of these threat intelligence led, and as the industry started leveraging threat intelligence better, right? A number of years ago, we said, wait, instead of just like getting in, why don't we understand other organizations in our industry that are getting hacked understand what the adversary did there and do those same tests against ourselves so that when the malicious actors come against us we're ready now this ethical hacking maturity model i just laid out isn't perfect right this is based on my experience and experience of people i've spoken to you might have done it completely different you may only do vulnerability scanning and vulnerability assessment. Maybe you do red teaming, but not purple teaming. Or maybe you do purple teaming, but maybe you don't do red teaming, right? So it all depends. Really, all of these need to do one thing, and that is bringing business value. And that is what all ethical hacking is about, is improving the business. So let's dive a little deeper into this. The red team. The red team is or a red team, the definition of a red team, is a practice of looking at a problem or situation from the perspective of an adversary. This came from the military. Back at, during the Vietnam War, the US didn't do so well in it. So they decided to test themselves and really be a, a devil's advocate. 
I've actually read uh, from Joe Vest's book, if you haven't uh, read that book, it's an excellent book on, on Red Team. One of the things there is that one of the original Red Teams were devil's advocates. When someone was going to get sainthood, they would uh, play the devil advocates role and see if they really deserved it or not. Now, a Red Team does that. They test assumptions, right? They look at the situation from an adversary's perspective. In the commercial world, what we're doing as a red team is making blue team better. We want to improve all our defenses, right? So we want to test and measure our people, our processes, and our technology. Now, the effort here is manual, right? Anyone that says they're going to automate the red team is probably not being completely honest because you need people thinking. You need people to understand and to move and whatnot. But we are creating a number of tools. I'm going to show you the C2 matrix. There's 55 uh, command and control tools there today. And we are doing some job, some good jobs automating, creating the attack infrastructure, as well as the TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, and how to emulate those from an automation perspective. Lastly, the frequency. The frequency of red team engagements are really intelligence led. Whenever the red team gets new intelligence that there's a new exploit out there, that there's a new tool, that there's a new TTP, right? Maybe here in this conference, we hear of a new technique that someone has employed. We're, we want to hear about that and we want to test it against ourselves. And there are some regulations that require you to test this on a yearly basis. And the customer is the blue teams, which is very different than the customer of a vulnerability assessment or a vulnerability scan or a pen test, which are the operations teams and the developers. In this case, the customer. And really what we're trying to do is to work better with the blue teams. So this leads us to adversary emulation. Is there a difference? Well, adversary emulation is a type of red team exercise. Red team exercises can be physical, they can be tabletop, they can be a number of different things, they can be phishing related. This is a type. And this type relies on leveraging cyber threat intelligence to understand an adversary that has the opportunity, capability, and intent to get into your organization, understand their behavior and how they do that, their tactics, techniques, and procedures. And then with that objective, try it against yourself. So really you are emulating an attack chain, right? And when we look at TTPs, and we're gonna look at some in a bit, those by themselves might not be worthy of an alert, right? The typical one, who am I? Are you going to alert every time someone does who am I in your organization? Imagine if you have 400,000 users or even 10,000 users. I'm sure you get a who am I at least a couple times a day. Are you gonna drop what you're doing and go see what happened? Maybe not. But if you see a who am I followed by an IP config, followed by some PowerShell execution, then maybe that's not someone typing that out. Maybe that is some malware. So those attack chains are important. That's part of what adversary emulation and why adversary emulation is so important. And then we wanna understand if the organization is prepared for a real attack. The effort, like I said, is very manual, but the customer is the entire organization. So some organizations have internal red teams, some of them don't, and both are good. So in an internal red team, that's great. That means your organization really understands the value here. You repeat a lot of engagements. You spend a lot of time retesting and you have insider knowledge because you do these tests over and over. So internal red teams shouldn't really be seen in it as an adversarial to the other teams, the other security teams, but more as a sparring partner, right? And I do this, I'm sure some of you like boxing or UFC, mixed martial arts, right? When you are fighting someone or before you have to go fight, you train and you train with a sparring partner. Do you knock each other out? No, you hit each other, but never to cause damage. And that's what an internal red team should do for the internal blue team. Now there are external red teams as well. They also bring value. They are offering this outside perspective, a new perspective that 
really emulates an external adversary a lot better. So you have some nice uh, experience there. They bring industry experience, some awesome, awesome red team consulting groups. Um, like my friends over at Grimm have an awesome red team uh, and they're innovating and doing some really cool stuff. But they're doing snapshot engagements, right? You hire the red team, they come for a two, three month engagement and then they leave. And you generally shouldn't get the same red team over and over, year over year, because you want that outside perspective. So why purple? Purple teams is really bringing these together. And you can do purple teaming, whether you have an external red team or an internal red team. It doesn't matter. You need someone to play the role of a red team. And really the difference is that you're working together. And purple is indeed getting a lot of uh, visibility. It's the new hotness, right? Uh, as you can see on the meme there. And why is that? And it's not because it's a new color, right? And by the way, we are not creative at all, right? We came up with a new term and it's purple because red and blue makes purple. Yeah, We, we should have been more creative. But the point is, it's not sexy because it's a new term. It's because of the business value that it provides your organization. You don't have to now wait for that one year engagement to see how you did or how you improved. You can now measure yourself more. So what exactly is a purple team exercise? Well, a purple team is a virtual team, right? We take the red team, we take the blue team, and they work together. There's a very limited amount of organizations that I'm aware of that have a full on purple team um, that do mostly detection engineering. <clears throat> Generally that falls under the blue team. So in this case, it's a virtual team where we work together to measure where we stand and improve that. So it always starts with cyber threat intelligence. It's extremely important. We want to understand a threat actor that has the capability, the intent, and the opportunity to attack us. We want to know as much as possible about that threat actor. So an example, in financial space, the malicious actors don't go and attack the big banks first. They go after smaller banks, right? Just as as it would make sense, right? You go after the smaller organizations, see how to get in, you improve, and then you move on to bigger ones. Well, if we share that information and we can test ourselves, when those bad guys and bad actors go after the bigger organizations or the next organization, because we use cyber threat intelligence, we might be able to observe them. We might be able to work with law enforcement. We might be able to catch them. So it's extremely important. So CTI has provided this threat actor. They're also going to provide the tactics, techniques, and procedures, right? Cyber threat intelligence can provide other things. They can provide domain names that are bad and IPs that are bad and artifacts that are bad. But really what we want to focus on is on the behavior, the TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures. Provide that to the red team. The red team will then create an adversary emulation plan. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to try to do to get into this organization. And then in your exercise, you table topic. What does that mean? We discuss it amongst the blue team, the CTI team, the red team, and we say, this is one of the TTPs that this actor does, where do you think we have controls? Oh, we might have controls on the endpoint or we use this product on the network. We do this over here. Great, you think it will catch this? I don't know if it'll catch it, it'll definitely log it, but I don't know if it'll alert. Great, now it's the red team's turn to actually do it, emulate it, actually execute it, just like a bad guy will. Actually execute it, don't just do simulations actually emulate it and see what happens. The blue team will one, learn from the red team, see how the malicious actor would attack, but then the blue team will share their screen and show the red team how they hunt for badness in their network, how they look at their logs, what SIM they use, what log aggregator they use, what local logging is occurring on the endpoints. And now the red team is learning and they will go around and see what they found, if they found the behaviors of that adversary. And if they didn't, 
can they fix anything? Can they tune anything? If they can, do it. Tune it. Tune it now. Let's see. And then test it again. The right team will do the same test again. Did it fit? Did you catch it this time? Yes. Awesome. Or no, this actually requires a little more changes. Okay. Let's add that to our action plan. And you repeat this for each TTP or each chain that this adversary is known to do. And hopefully you're measuring and improving people, process, and technology. So to do this, if you've never done this, I suggest using a framework that's already there. This will help you sell to your senior management. You will be able to say, look, this is what the industry is doing. This is what we want to do. And the Purple Team Exercise Framework is a small document. It's 20 pages long, explains exactly how to go through this, how to leverage cyber threat intelligence, how to prepare for the exercise, how to execute it, and how to do lessons learned. So that's completely free. I highly recommend you download it and just read through it. There's other frameworks, right? A lot of senior managers have learned of the cyber kill chain. This came out in 2011 by Lockheed Martin, and it explains seven steps that a malicious actor does. But there's a number of issues with that model. It was great that a lot of people understand it. It had command and control, which was great. But then it had action on objectives. And action on objectives really encompasses a lot of things. So Paul Poles, and shout out to him, wrote a paper called Unified Cyber Kill Chain. This brought the cyber kill chain with a number of other ones to create a three-step process of gaining an initial foothold, doing network propagation, and then doing action on objectives, which is more realistic. And each of those main steps has a lot of substance. If you are in the financial space, then there's a ton of regulation you can look at. All of these are public. The Bank of England has the CBEST intelligence-led testing framework. The European Central Bank asks that you go through a threat intelligence-based ethical red team, or TIBER, TIBER EU, and then there's TIBER for each country. There's the Monetary Authority of Singapore that has one, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, and then one of the frameworks that I was an author on is the framework for the regulatory use of pen testing in the financial services industry. Because in a global organization, you have all of these regulators asking you to do these red teams, and you can't possibly do six zero-knowledge red team engagements in a one-year period. It just doesn't make sense. If you're emulating for three or four months, then you're going to have multiple exercises going on at once. I highly don't recommend that. So at the end, we have a beautiful testing framework. And that is as done by MITRE ATT&CK. And ATT&CK stands for Adversary Tactics and um, Adversary Tactics, Techniques, and Common Knowledge. And more than a common knowledge, I would say it's a common language. It allows us to speak the same language between cyber threat intelligence, red teams, and blue teams. So when someone gets attacked in another organization, we can grab that intelligence, map it to MITRE ATT&CK, red team can emulate it, blue team can map it to what detections they have, and focus on the areas where they might have gaps. So here's your MITRE ATT&CK uh, framework, which we, we love showing. So let's start with cyber threat intelligence. So when I was asked to do uh, this talk, I wanted to pick a threat actor that was relevant to Argentina. So I went into MITRE ATT&CK and I looked up Argentina. And there was one group, this group called Honeybee. And I read a little through there and I said, cool, I could definitely uh, emulate this particular threat actor as a case study in, in our talk. And I looked into it and started doing my research, started putting together everything. And then, of course, um, we have a number of sources. So Honeybee is a campaign led by an unknown actor. So they didn't, they couldn't attribute this actor to any location. Attribution is generally hard. And it's okay. We actually don't really care where they're from um, at this point. We want to know who are they targeting. And in this case, they're targeting humanitarian aid organizations that have been active in Vietnam, Singapore, Argentina, Japan, Indonesia, and Canada. And they've been active since August of 2017 and as recently as February 2018. 
And then we actually didn't hear more about them. So McAfee has a great blog post on this. I went through this blog post. I also went through MITRE ATT&CK site, really creating all of this for this presentation. And as luck would have it, as I was preparing this talk, I read on the news that NetWalker ransomware hits the Argentinian government, demands $4 million. But I've already done a ransomware talk. I did a ransomware talk at DEF CON about Evil Corp. Evil Corp was the group that had to Garmin and ca caused that global outage for a week, seven days. People couldn't uh, see how their uh, fitness tracking was going. There were boats that couldn't go out because they didn't have GPS. And there were planes that couldn't take off because they used Garmin Fly. So I did that talk. And that one was a little different than NetWalker. That one was uh, a malware. So the group Evil Corp got into Garmin. They moved laterally. And then they dropped a malware called Wasted Locker. So a lot of this ransomware is all very similar. Um, so I decided not to switch and do NetWalker. I had already had the cool talk title of Don't Get Stung by a Honeybee. So um, I didn't do this, but I did see that recently. And now this might be something that you do want to look at. Um, my talk uh, from DEF CON is online and you can see how to emulate ransomware. It's gonna be a similar intro to here, but then of course the TTPs are gonna be a little different. So. What do we do? Well, one of the nice things is if the threat actor is in MITRE ATT&CK, then it already has the attack mapping, which is great, right? Because now we're using cyber threat intelligence and we're creating a little map here of what this threat actor does. So in this case, we have Honeybee and Honeybee um, does execution through Visual Basic and Windows command line. They create services. They do registry run keys. They bypass user access control. So you can kind of visualize what this threat actor does. It's a very, very useful tool and it's free. You can just click on this link and, and visit it. But when you propose this, you probably can't just propose a, a heat map of MITRE ATT&CK and say, we're going to do this. You should kind of organize it in a, in a better way. So I've done that for you for this particular threat actor. This is Honeybee. And we see here that they do command and control through application layer protocol, file transfer protocols. They use FTP for command and control. And that's really interesting. And we'll talk about that in a second. Then they do execution through Visual Basic, Windows command shell, and service execution. They do defense evasion by modifying the registry, doing process injection, doing code signing, uh, removing files, doing file deletion, and obfuscating files. Then once they're on the system, they do some discovery, like file and directory discovery, process discovery, system information discovery. They do privilege escalation by bypassing UAC and using the app cert DLL to register new DLLs. They do uh, persistence, so they stay on the target system by modifying the registry run keys and creating services. They do collection by archiving uh, collected data, staging that data, and then exfiltrating it through FTP, right? Because that was the command and control channel. So we've leveraged cyber threat intelligence here that we found on MITRE ATT&CK quite easily. About a threat actor that is active in your country. And we've created a little profile to kind of have an idea of how we would emulate this uh, threat actor. So the next step is planning. And planning is a lot of what we do in red team engagements and purple team engagements and adversary emulations. I have a two day class and a fourth of that class, 25% of that class is planning right and i don't talk longer about planning because i know most people are here not for the planning but for actually hacking right so i'm not going to take too long on this i only have one slide but planning is super important if you talk to any red teamer you're going to see and they will probably tell you that they probably spend more time planning than they actually do testing and that is because 
here's where we need to understand the business value. Just like the adversary has goals and objectives in your target environment, you need to have goals and objectives. And what are those goals, right? Could be that you wanna see if this malicious actor can get into you. Maybe you heard that they hacked the company across the street from you or one of your competitors, which you liked because they're your competitor, but you're worried they're gonna come after you next. So what are the goals and objectives? Document those and focus around those. The goals and objectives are going to be your primary focus. You are going to follow some sort of plan always with that goal in sight. Don't just go off on tangent because we need to provide business value. Then you need to also decide, is this going to be a red team engagement that's zero knowledge, meaning that the blue team doesn't know about it, only the chief information security officer, or maybe the chief technology officer knows, but no one else? Or is it gonna be a full knowledge exercise? Is the blue team going to be aware of what we're doing? Are we gonna work with them? Are we gonna show them what we're doing as we go? Even though some things will fail, that's good. Document the things you that fail. Sometimes red teams don't wanna do this because they don't wanna show failure. They only wanna show what worked. And that's not right, right? We're in this together. It's not about beating up and knocking out our partner. It's about working together. So another thing you want is an exercise coordinator that's really a project manager because you're gonna have cyber threat intelligence coming in from maybe an internal team or maybe a vendor. You're also going to have the blue team to worry about and communicate to. You're gonna have senior management. You're gonna have the red team. So whether you're doing a purple team exercise or a red team engagement, you definitely need an exercise coordinator and that should not be the red team. I did that for a couple of engagements and I do not recommend it. Another thing you're gonna to have to decide is are you going to work from an assumed breach perspective or are you gonna do a full end-to-end -end kill chain? Are you going to start out from the internet and try to gain initial access or are you going to start with that initial foothold now depending on your goals and objectives this decision will be easier to make now initial access takes time it takes us a lot of time to figure out who to fish create a phishing email create a payload that doesn't get caught by antivirus that goes through all your systems that you will eventually run and that will gain us that initial foothold initial access is one tactic in miter attack and if you are mature enough to understand this or your organization is there's always going to be a way in right there's infinite ways into your organization there's insider threats there's uh, phishing, right? Someone will always fall for a phishing email. I don't know anyone that's ran a campaign and gotten 0% phishing. Um, or there's going to be a vulnerability. There might be a zero day that you don't know about. Or from the time Microsoft releases a patch to the time that you actually patch, there's going to be waves. In. So the assumed breach model suggests that you know you're going to get breached. So in order to bring the most business value, why don't we start with that initial foothold? We forget about initial access and we focus on all the other tactics and techniques in MITRE ATT&CK. There's over 250 of them that are not related to initial access. Why not focus on those? Because you're mature and you understand this. Then you have rules of engagement. And of course, there's going to be rules. For example, on that ransomware. When I do ransomware emulations, I don't encrypt real business data. I don't delete real business data and I don't stop the business from working because I want to prove my point, right? I have rules that say get to where I am and instead of bringing down the system or encrypting things, create new files and then encrypt those because you'll still see the crypto, you'll still see the new files, I'll still download a ransom note, but I'm not actually going to delete your backups and make you pay right so there's always rules of engagement and lastly there is attack infrastructure and red team attack infrastructure takes a while to set up we've been doing pretty well at figuring out ways to automate this but 
that involves buying domain names, buying or acquiring TLS certificates, setting up email servers, setting up phishing websites to steal credentials or to host malicious files. You have to set up uh, cloud uh, machines for your command and control servers. You need to set up redirectors. There's a whole talk on this. I can spend a, an entire one or two days talking about setting up this attack infrastructure, right? But we don't have the time for that. And again, you don't love planning, I get it. You can uh, ping me on, on the planning steps later. So one of the things you have to do kind of as part of planning and preparation, but still kind of exercise execution, this is kind of in the middle ground, is you need to determine what tools you are going to use. And um, this is a project that I started called the C2 matrix, the command and control matrix. It's a Google sheet that started out just as a spreadsheet of various different command and controls that were out there. We released this, and I did this with uh, a few people, with Bryson Bohr, Adam M M Mash, um, and it's a community project now. So if you do hear about a new command and control, just tag us on Twitter um, or contribute fully uh, open source and free. And it started just with this Excel site. And then I moved it to Google Sheets because it's easier to share. And it listed all the different command and control frameworks. When we released this back in November of 2019, there was 23 command and control frameworks that we knew about. Today, right now, there's 55 command and control frameworks. Out of those, five are commercial and the other 50 are on GitHub as open source and free command and controls. So you might have heard of some of these. You might have heard, I'm sure you've heard of Metasploit, right? But things like Empire, Covenant, right? There's a, a, a number of, of famous ones, right? Um, and then there's new ones. And new ones are popping up all the time. So the original reason for this was that as a red teamer, I need to emulate a particular adversary. And that adversary has TTPs. And I need to choose which tool will help me emulate that better. So if you go to the c2matrix.com, one of the things there is a questionnaire where you can actually go through various different questions and it will tell you which C2s match the criteria that you need to use. And then, of course, we've expanded the list of capabilities. For example, some command and control frameworks that you set up and I guess we should tell you how this works, right? You set up a command and control server somewhere on the internet and you get a domain name and a certificate and all that fun stuff. And when you compromise a system internally, it communicates out to you. We call that heartbeats or callbacks or beacons, right? There's a number of names for it, but pretty much that system you've compromised connects out to the internet through a communication protocol. So you can see on the screenshot there in blue, the channel, what is the communication channel used? There's TCP. You can see a lot of them use HTTP. There's HTTP2, there's HTTP3, DNS, DNS over HTTP, et cetera. So that's kind of important if uh, a particular threat actor uses um, a particular tool. There's also agents. Um, what operating system are you going to deploy this particular payload to? Is it going to be on Windows? Is it going to be on Linux? Is it going to be on Mac? Really depends on where you are going to deploy. You might have to choose a C2 based on that. And then from there, we realized that installing these C2s is not exactly easy. So to lower the learning curve, we have released a free virtual machine. We actually did this in collaboration with SANS, and it's called the SANS Slingshot C2 Matrix Virtual Machine. And that has a number of C2s already installed. So all you have to do is start this virtual machine and start using the C2. Now, if you don't know how to use that C2, we came up with something else called the how-to. how-to.thec2matrix.com allows you to 
select the particular command and control framework, and it walks you through how to use it. So I'm going to show you this uh, tool shortly. Follow C2 underscore matrix on Twitter for the latest updates. So one of the things that caught my eye on what Honeybee did and what makes it different than others, than other actors I hadn't really played with uh, before is a technique from MiterAttack T1548.002. And that's bypassing user access control. And user access control is a window security feature designed to split admin privileges from normal user privileges. So we all know, especially in Linux users, right? You know, you should never run as root, right? You run as a normal user. Well, in Windows, it took a long time to realize that. And to this day, we still have a lot of users that are local admin on their Windows system. And that's not good. So what did Windows do to protect you from yourself or your end users from themselves is they implemented this token integrity level which gives you different restrictions and different privileges based on how that process is running. So even if you're a local admin on your system and you open Internet Explorer, eh, that's not realistic. No one uses Internet Explorer, right? If you open Chrome or Firefox, you don't open that with an, a high privilege token. You open that with a medium integrity token. So there's four token types, low, medium, high, and system. So even if you're running with UAC, you run everything with medium integrity. Now, if you want to run something with privilege, you have to right click it and do run as admin. And if you are a local admin, then you get the screen that's here on the right, which shows user access control. Are you sure you want to run this uh, program with this privilege? And most people just click yes, right? So this is user access control. You already have a privilege and you want to bypass this little message, right? Because that message will show people that you have access to their system, right? So how do we do that? There's an awesome, awesome project called UAC Me, like UAC Me. Um, and it has over 60 methods documented on how you can bypass UAC. On the right here, we have a wonderful example. Shout out to James Forshaw, awesome, awesome hacker. Um, this one, uh, you can read and you see the type. There's different types. There's DLL hijacking, which does DLL search order. The way that Windows loads DLLs, dynamic link libraries, is based on a set of rules. It's about six rules. They'll first look into memory to see if the DLL is already there. Then you'll look into various uh, locations, such as um, the, the hard-coded location in the registry, then into that same folder, et cetera. So if you can get and write your DLL earlier, then your DLL ex executes before the application does, and you bypass it. There's application compatibility, which is um, if you're still running Windows 2000 uh, type of applications, you need them to be compatible with Windows 10. That is one of the features built into Windows that lets you do that. There's elevated COM interfaces, there's shell APIs, um, and there's the ability to just ask, right? If you just ask to elevate, you'll get that pop-up. So on the right here, James Forshaw shows uh, one example. This is example 34 of 62, I believe. And this one only works on 8.1, on Windows 8.1. So if you are going against a Windows 8.1, you can actually see and follow this little guide to figure out how to get around UAC. It's a pretty cool tool. So let's do a few demos here um, for you. And um, and hopefully uh, we, we nail down everything we talked about. So first things first, attack.mitre.org. One of the best ways and what I showed you earlier is I just went here and did Argentina. And we give it a second and we see the honeybee group. We click on honeybee and here we see the information I gave earlier, along with all the techniques used. As you can see, there's no tactic name here. There's also no order. Generally, when you do emulations, you're gonna set up the command and control first. That's why command and control is one of the first ones. And we see here the command and control is via FTP. 
So that's important. We go through and we see other things that they were doing, what software they used. Um, this looks like just living off the land software, such as command prompt, registry key, says simple, and task list. And there's the reference to the McAfee article, right? So this is uh, pretty straightforward. We can click over here, uh, attack navigator layer, and do view. And it's going to take us to MITRE ATT&CK. This is a dynamic site where it shows in blue everything that this particular actor uh, does. So you have to scroll it because we now have sub techniques. So um, yeah, there's this is it works um, and it's wonderful you can open up new layers um, you can select up here selection select a different threat actor here's a uh, apt19 we can select that and change it to red see what other threat actors do um, which is awesome I, I really like attack navigator right but one of the things about honeybee was the command and control channel right you go over to the right uses file transfer protocol, Honeybee uses FTP. So that's interesting. So let's go over to the C2 matrix. This is the website of uh, the C2 matrix. On the top right, you have the matrix. So if you click on that, you get this Excel sheet, right? And the Excel sheet has a lot of information. Over here on the left-hand side, we have the name of the C2. And you can see here, that it has grown significantly to 55 C2s. The next thing we say is the license. You can see that some of these are free while others are commercial. And we can see the GitHub for the particular site as well as a website if they own a website and also the Twitter handle. So all of this is C2 info. Then we see information about who evaluated this particular C2. So you can see there's some here that don't have evaluators. That means that you can contribute and test these out. You have the date that something was evaluated and the version. So these versions change quite a bit. They might not be the latest version. This is the latest version of what, um, of what we try. So um, then you can see how we implemented it. Some of these are implemented with PIP, some are binaries, some have Docker, etc. Then we have the how-to. The how-to explains how to use each of these various um, C2s, which is pretty cool. You can just kind of click on uh, this and it will take you to the how-to site where it shows you how to use the C2. I'll jump into that later. It tells you which ones are in Slingshot. This is the free VM. I'll show you in a little bit. And which ones are getting added to Kali. So one of the things I've been doing is working with the folks from Offensive Security to get some of these C2s into Kali as well. Then we have the language, the code that was used. There's a C2 server and there's a C2 agent or uh, implant. So you can see here servers, a lot of them on Python, while a lot of the agents are PowerShell, like Empire uses mostly PowerShell, but there's a big move in the industry to C Sharp. You'll see a lot of that. And you'll see some that are created with things like C um, and, uh, and native code, which is really interesting. There's also the UI. So if you are running a red team engagement, you probably want multi-user capabilities in your C2. Um, the UI could be a command line interface, a web interface, or a GUI. I've recently added dark mode because Covenant now has dark mode and some other C2s are, are moving there. Apparently this is important to some people. Uh, APIs, so you can do automation. Implants, Windows, Linux, and Mac. The communication channels. And then all of the capabilities, right? So for this instance, we need to find one that does FTP. So if we go and just look at the FTP, or what we can do is just filter this for yes, we find that there's actually only one C2 that uses FTP as a command and control channel. So if we find out more information about this, unfortunately, it is a commercial tool, so we cannot download it. But there's a link here. We can click on that and see a little bit more info on them and check them out if we really have to do FTP. Now, for most C2s, 
I would recommend HTTP. HTTP and HTTPS are probably going to be the faster uh, C2s. And remember, what your uh, implant does is it connects out to the internet after a certain amount of time, and you have a lot of different capabilities here as well um, for what you want to do. So one of the things is having key exchange, right? You don't want everything, if you're using HTTP or FTP in this, in this instance, right? You want some security between the machines you compromise and your server. There's steganography, if they're proxy aware, some organizations have proxies on the way out. If you can do domain fronting, that's a great way to do redirection. If you can customize the profile, change things like the user agent, and as you go through, one of the really important things is logging. As a red team or in a purple team, you have to log everything that you do so that you can prove that you did what you did and a bad uh, actor didn't do something else. So um, all that information is here. There's some information about detection, et cetera. Now, what I wanna do is show you the documentation. The documentation is a Git book and the first thing here is the SANS Slingshot C2 Matrix Edition. And this is a virtual machine that you can download and it will run, oh, sorry. There we go. It's a virtual machine. It brings Covenant, Empire 3, Faction, Quadic, Merlin, Metasploit, Silent Trinity, and Sliver. So it definitely gets you started. It has Vector as well, which is an awesome tool for managing uh, red team engagements. We have a lab environment here that we show you how we evaluated these. We had attackers, we had a PF sense firewall, we had victims on the other side. I walked through, you can see videos here of how this was done. We ran Wireshark, we ran Sysmon, if you wanna learn how to do all that. And then for each one of these, um, we show how to deploy um, and run through these. So for instance, uh, this is Empire. We explain how to run through Empire, how to emulate a particular threat actor, how to set everything up, etc. how to do some of the TTPs. For example, here, discovery, get the UAC level. Um, that tells you what level you're currently running as before you try to elevate it. Um, I also did Posh C2, um, emulating Cozy Bear explaining how to do that. So there's a ton of data here on this um, site that can show you how to do all of these TTPs, how to emulate them and how to test them against yourself. Um, just real quick, this is what the VM looks like. It's a nice little screenshot there of a Slingshot Linux distribution, C2 matrix. And then everything is in slash opt. And we can see here, we have a number of uh, the C2s already installed and you just have to follow what it says here on the, um, on the how to. So the last thing here I wanna show you was about abusing UAC. Um, in this case, uh, this UAC bypass, uh, it's its own sub technique. I believe it was 004, no, what number was it? Was it three? No, nope, you can do it through sudo. You can do it, there we go, UAC bypass. And we can see um, what threat actors have used this. This one in particular has been used by a lot. And here you see UAC me. So you, this is the UAC me site on GitHub that also walks you through how to actually do all. So in the interest of time, I have to continue, um, but lots of stuff there. Now how to not get stung by the honeybee. Well, one of the main things I saw here is FTP as a C2 channel. And that's something we rarely see. You shouldn't allow FTP anywhere in your network because it's a clear text protocol, right? So if you allow it outbound, then you have the ability of having C2, might be something you wanna test. And if you have FTP inbound, you should probably check that too. Other things you can do is monitor egress from your network. How does traffic go from inside your network out? For example, you might only allow HTTP. That's great. But how do you know it's an actual web traffic and not 
malicious traffic. Check for things like heartbeat. If one particular system calls out every 30 seconds, then something might be going on. Also think about jitter. What if it's not every 30 seconds on the dot, but if it's every 20 seconds and then every 27 seconds and then every 22 seconds, you might have some jitter. Also, this threat actor did a lot of exfiltration. So look at the amount of data going out of your network. You can test this pretty easily. Upload a gig of traffic to a site on the internet. Don't upload bad <laughs> actual business data, but upload it and see if anyone noticed. No one noticed, upload 10 gigs. No one noticed, upload 100 gigs until someone notices. Obviously do all of this with permission. And then for the UAC bypass, ensure all users aren't local admin, right? Because if you already have that user as a local admin, then the UAC bypass will be inevitable. They will eventually escalate their privileges. And no, Bob in accounting does not need local admin privileges. So um, if you like this adversary emulation stuff, then definitely check out Threat Thursday. Um, we post on Twitter and LinkedIn, it's hashtag Threat Thursday. Every week we introduce an adversary. So we're gonna have Honeybee and there's gonna be the link for Honeybee. Um, last week we did Speak Up, which was a Mac uh, OS malware that we replicated. Um, and we do pretty much what we just did here. We look at cyber threat intelligence, we map it to MITRE ATT&CK, we give you a navigator layer if it wasn't already mapped. Then we create an adversary emulation plan. We share that plan on our GitHub. We emulate the adversary with the video and we talk about how to defend. And all of this is a weekly thing uh, for the community for all of you. So definitely check that out. Lastly, I did not do all of this on my own. Um, all of this has been years and years of experience and working with people and giving back to a community. So I'm not taking credit for most of it. A lot of it has um, been out there and what we've done is just brought it together in a way that we can deliver it in one hour or less, right? But these are programs that are being ran in large organizations. Here's a whole bunch of references for you. And I think that is it for my time. I really appreciate yours. Muchas gracias por tenerme. Eh, espero que les haya gustado. Y si tienen preguntas, acá estamos para responderlas. Muchas gracias.